All right, here's the beginning of our setup. We're getting lined up on things here. And I want to make sure I'm as close as possible to being on the Y center line, which is this direction on this machine. So I put a tool holder in here, call it Chuck, with a half inch uh, carbide blank in it. And I've actually put um, Sharpie marks on both sides of this blank, and you'll see what I mean with that. And I've set it approximately the same length as this tool. It's a little bit longer, but it's pretty close. So we're going to try to be on center line at the actual location. This is kind of important too. I mean, if there's any kind of error in the machine itself, this will help um, reduce that. So before we put this in the spindle and touch things off with it, I want to get lined up on the Y center line. So let me get, get you in here a little closer so we can kind of see what's happening here. Maybe I can... Now I set this... Um, I got this tool holder with this mark, this uh, Sharpie mark pointing toward me. And I'm swinging my, the, the lathe spindle because we're going to actually bore with the turning spindle in this operation. It's kind of a little bit backwards. The machine doesn't really, it's really not designed to work this way. We're going to be going backwards. We're going to actually be turning the, the turning spindle here that the indicator's mounted on right now. And the workpiece is going to be in the milling spindle clamped and rotated in this direction or oriented and clamped like it's a lathe tool, if you will. So I'm going to rotate this around and I'm going to rotate the tool holder with it to my other mark on this side. I'm going to swing for my, uh, I'm kind of having difficulty seeing this because it's cameras right in front of it, but I'm going to swing for my null point here on my uh, dial indicator. Okay, it says that I could uh, maybe jog this a little, a tenth more this direction. So we're... Pretty close to zero there. I'm going to swing it back around. And the only reason I'm turning the, the milling tool in the spindle as I do this, as well as if there's any run out at all in that tool holder, in theory, this would... Um, cancel that out too. Okay, so that's, in fact, let me rotate this and you can see there's just a little bit of run out in the tool. So what I'm trying to do is keep the same orientation of the tool with the Sharpie marks here, if you will. So that's our Y0 point. And I'm going to set the fixture offset for my Y0 right there, which I'm doing right now. In fact, let me, uh, actually already done this but I'll show you how it's done go to the work offset you run the cursor down here to the Y and you go to teach zero input zero over here input and so on and so now we're on Y zero I don't know if you can see that with the reflection so that's the that's the initial thing we have to do now we have to take this, this boring head, and we've got to mount it in the spindle, in the lathe spindle actually, and we've got to adjust it so that we're, we can have a starting bore size. I've made the program to go kind of backwards here. Um, I've actually described the tool as a drill, or a, you can describe it as anything, you're going to put a boring cycle on it, and, uh, and it's going to actually uh, come down here and rotate the, the turning spindle as if it was drilling a hole in here, or boring a hole, if you will, and we're just going to bore and come back out as if, we were, as if this was actually the milling spindle, and we're going to bore the hole in the tool holder. With, so everything doing this everything should be on center line as close as it could possibly be now set the the length offset of my tool to be 
down five inches like my CAD model for that should be the center that should be the center of this this is five inches from this from the um, contact face of the taper to the center of this hole and so I set that on, on the Mazak I'm using tool number four 4D and I've called it just a special tool. I've set the A dimension at five inches and this happens to be the, the B dimension to the face of that uh, flat area, which would be right here on the tool. So let me, uh, let me swap out this tool holder and everything. And uh, I'm gonna change the tool number 4D in the control and then I can bring this back down and, and I can start touching things off. I could set my Z0 on the, on the tool holder itself on this face, touching off the boring bar, if you will. I don't know if you can see that with all this stuff in the background. And then, uh, well, I'll, let's, let's go ahead and do it. I'll, I'll show you with the video. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just, first I'm gonna just take this tool out of the spindle here, of the, of the milling spindle, because that's actually not just a um, tool that's not offset or anything. I'm just using it for the alignment purposes. So we're going to get this here out. First, I got to orient the tool. so I can take it out of there. I'm gonna jog this out of the way here. Now on this, oh, I had, I had a few questions about this thing in the uh, comments of the previous video. So let me, let me take the tool out and I'll show you what this is actually. Some people asked about this. If you wanted to, um, so this is just the, the capto shank doesn't actually need this retention stud thing in it. But to run in this kind of a thing, which is a manually clamped capto adapter, you have to use this retention stud. It has some serrated, um, it has some serrated uh, clamping pieces that, that grab onto these uh, serrations in this retention stud and kind of suck it back. It also has some pins in there. I don't know if you could see in here. Let me see if I can possibly, let me get a light and I'll show you. Oh, maybe you can and maybe you can't. Let's see. There's some, there's some, uh, pieces in there, I don't know if you can see them, you see those pins? Those pins actually push the tool out when it releases it from the taper, but there's, I don't know if you can see those serrated clamping jaws like things in this, and they, they just pinch together. This bolt up here just pulls them together. They don't have to worry about centering because it's gonna center automatically on this thing. And it's just gonna pull the tool back into the spindle. It also has an um, O-ring on here to seal on the tool holder if you're running coolant, if you were doing that. So this thing is, um, this thing is designed, really, if you had like a, um, maybe you had like a horizontal boring mill with a, and this was a, um, it'd have to be a pretty big one, like a five inch quill or something, because I think this is about five inches in diameter. And you could bolt this right on the end of the quill, and then you could run capto tools in your boring mill. With, this happens to be a C8 um, adapter. They do make smaller ones. They, they make a, I noticed in the, on the website they had a C5 one for sure. Probably a C6 and a C8 one. So you could convert um, a machine by bolting this on the face of the spindle. Some spindles actually have tap holes and then and this might line up to them I don't know you know like on boring heads they, they put those big face mills with the keys and the, and the four holes so that might be 
designed to work that way. It's not the way I'm using it, but that's what this thing is kind of made for. So you could put it on a, like a horizontal boring mill and uh, clamp it on there, and then you could put Capto tools in the, in the spindle. But what we're gonna do here what we're going to do here is we're going to put this boring head in here. Now there's, on, on all Capto shanks, they have this little dimple. And if you line up this dimple, you're in there the, the correct direction. First, I got to put the retention stud on here. You see how, the, you know, nothing holds this in the, in the holder unless you have this. Normally, like I say, a Capto shank doesn't need a retention stud because it's a... Uh, It's held in with, you know, with a clamping device on the ID of the holder, kind of like an NSK shank is as well. And rotate it around here to get to the... And right now it won't go in because those pins are holding it out a little bit. That eject it, and I have to turn this a little bit and uh, then shove it all the way in there. And then now it'll clamp onto it with those uh, kind of like saw teeth on the retention stud. Tighten that out. So now, we can run this boring head in the spindle. Now let me change. Get the camera here so you can kind of see this maybe. Let me change to tool number 4.0. Oh, um, D is 4.04. Tool change, 4.04. .04. Gotta close the doors to do this on this machine. Can't do anything on this machine with the doors open, as I've said before. And we'll push cycle start. We should change to that tool. Now there's, there's gonna be a big drill, I think, come up. I got to take that out and put the other tool in there. Actually, while we're on the subject of drill, you know, looking at it, we might as well talk about this a little bit. I've used this, this is an allied um, uh, drill, but it's not really a spade drill, although it has a spade tip in the middle and it has two carbide inserts on the outside. This drill's, um, I think it's two and a sixteenth in diameter. And uh, these, these drills really work good. I've had really good success with these drills because it works better than, they make one that takes this carbide um, Gen 3 tip, they call it, in the middle, but I have found that doesn't work as good because the slower surface footage in the middle of the tool likes this, um, this high-speed steel or high-speed cobalt um, spade drill tip, and the, the higher surface footage is better for the carbide out here. So. Really, this works better, in my opinion, than the one that has the carbide uh, Gen 3 tip in the middle of it. And I've drilled in some um, ex extremely tough materials, ink and nails and, and hardened steels and everything with this drill, and it really works good. This is, this is a really good look working drill. The only thing I could complain about is I wish that I could get it with an integral capto shank on it instead of, it has like a two inch shank, so you gotta put it in this big huge two inch end mill holder. And so we're gonna put this, the spindle should be oriented in the right direction if I set the tool up correctly, like that. interesting sounded a little bit funny there okay and then we're gonna I'm just gonna um, manually touch things off here 
to the to our actual boring tool we haven't got a we've only got kind of a rough setting here of where the tool should be so if I've done things correctly here I should be able to jog this over to Y zero now that I already set it right there we get a little bit of light here because it's kind of dark right here so you can maybe see what's happening here and I should be able to come down to X0 here and I should be sort of in the right place we're gonna see here in a second because when I machined this uh, part initially, I made this dimension from the gauge line of the spindle. If you remember in the last video, I actually set my, my zero and Z on the face of this thing. So that's where the gauge line would be. And I set that in the tool offset to, like I just showed you, to five inches. So this should be fairly well centered on that bore now if I've done everything correctly. So now what I have to do, I think first I'm gonna set my Z offset. What I'm just gonna do is take a gauge pin. I'm gonna set the zero right on the face of the tool here. The, the machine doesn't know that I have, I'm doing this backwards. In reality, I've set the, um, I've set a length on the tool in the cam software so that it would think it's they think it's boring a hole in a piece of material with this tool here by turning the spindle but I'm, I'm actually doing it in the reverse but it, it, it doesn't really know any different it's gonna it's gonna come down here and bore back an inch and an eighth into this thing for my uh, little uh, spindle cartridge thing and uh, it doesn't know any different, it just knows the movements, even though I've reversed the setup here. So right, right there, I wanna teach it a half an inch in Z, or a half an inch negative, actually. So let me, let me go over here to the... So right now we're setting it nine inches something because that's where this distance is right now from the face of this spindle out to here. I'm gonna reset this. I'm going to the, the same way to the work offset. I'm using G54 here. And we're going to run the cursor down to Z and we're going to go teach. And we're going to go minus 0.5 or, or to allow for that gauge pin that I just used. And we're going to go input. And if I go back here to the position screen and hit reset, I should be setting at a half an inch in Z. So that's the way you do that. So now that we've got that set, I can kind of tweak this boring head a little bit. So what I'm going to do is get a rough setting here. Let me get some tools. Let me just... Uh, I'm going to set this coming up to... A, oh, I, over, I overshot it. See, there's a, I don't know if you can see that right here. See, there's a mark right here. I'm gonna just set my zero right here for right now, approximately, and then snug the clamp, all right? And then, well, what I'm gonna do is loosen these screws on the side. This has a kind of a dovetail, um, let's see if you can see this boring head better. A little light over here would be a little better for this. This has kind of a, a dovetail set up on this uh, boring head, and this mount of this bar can slide in the dovetail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loosen these screws that are clamping the dovetail so I can move it on there. 
And I'm gonna actually jog the machine up into the bore a little bit and I'm just gonna bring it over till it touches that and snug one of these screws up for the moment. And I'm gonna jog it away. I'm gonna tighten these pretty pretty tight, not you know excessively tight, but so I don't want that to move in the dovetail. Now I can make all my all the rest of my adjustment because I'm within like about um, I think I left about 15,000 stock on that ID. So this is going to be um, as close to 25 millimeters to where our um, that little head slides in there. Real nice, like I can, you know, just slide it in there, but there's no play to it. So I should be. Let's take a little look at this and see. I should be pretty close to lined up all the way around now. All right, let's try this. We put it in the memory mode. I'm gonna run the program from N1. Let's see how it goes. If everything is right. Remember, I set the offset in the Z and the fixture offset out. As it comes down here, I'm gonna slow down the rapid. I don't know if you can hear me over that spindle. I'm gonna slow it down just to be safe. Let's see what happens here. Okay, it's starting to feed the boring cycle. Should get about three eighths of an inch from the end of that bar and then reverse directions out in Z. And then after it finishes, it should stop the spindle and should come forward to where I could measure it with a dial bore gauge. Let's see how that works. Okay, it's feeding backwards now, out of the bore. And what I put, I put a go-to statement in the program to go back to the beginning N1. So it's coming out here to the stop position, turning the spindle off. So where I can measure the bore there. And then if I push start here, Again, I, I've sped up the rapid here again. It's clear of everything. It should go back and start the program over again. Okay, so that looks like that's working all right. So now, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna change too much or anything. I'm gonna move the boring head out just a little bit more because it was, it was just barely cleaning up. I'm gonna go another revolution. It'll be another four thousandths there. For some reason I can't find the wrench for this boring head right at the moment. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna set the um, work offset back in minus one point five. Should be at. I wrote this number down just to be safe. Eleven six one six. Okay, it's in the right place. So now let's. Um, Go back and restart the program at N1 and see what happens. We're going to run it for real right now. See what should cut a little bit on that. Um, like I said, you're kind of faking the machine out, telling it it's doing something, but it's doing it backwards from where the program was really made. Here we go. So it should be an inch in front of the part there. Stopping, I push feed hold just to be safe. Actually come up to 30 thousandths to start the boring cycle. There we go. So 
So far, it looks pretty good. Okay, it's backing out now, as you can see. Depending on the finish this leaves, I might just run it dry like this. If it, if it leaves a decent finish. Or I could actually squirt some tap magic in there or something. Let's, okay. Let's see what it looks like. Wait for the doors to open. The light kind of travels with that door. Finish looks good. Actually, I'm, I think I'm going to run it dry. That way we can see what's happening with the camera, too. Didn't quite clean up all the way around. I'm going to have to set up a bore gauge, a dial bore gauge, to this um, appropriate diameter. rerunning it until we get it out to size. I think it might be helpful for me to show setting up the dial bore gauge. So let's see, we want um, 25 millimeters times is 0.98425 inches. So 0.9843 let's say. Let me get the gauge box. start with, let's set up a um, stack of gauge blocks. You get these. We're gonna need we're gonna need this set too, but first we gotta get the gauge blocks. So we got 800, let's see. Point, point 0.9843. We're gonna say minus point 0.1003 for our tenths gauge block, which is gonna be this one right here. Make sure that's the one, yeah. We're gonna need that block. And then we're gonna need uh, minus 0.750, we'll call it. So we're gonna need the three quarter inch gauge block and the 134 thousandths gauge block. 34 thousandths here. I'm gonna ring those together. this I get the now let me get a micrometer I got a big mess here right now I got okay let's just measure that to be sure nine eight four three that looks good. Let's get one of those spindle units. Nine eight three nine. We'll call it three nine. So it's a little bit less. It's about a hat four ten thousand smaller than the actual twenty five millimeters. That sort of makes sense for it to fit in a twenty five millimeter a holder. Um, but we'll set the the. Um, We'll set the dial bore gauge to the actual dimension. We'll put this away for right now. We're going to need some end blocks for this, which let's use these here. I'm going to, I'm going to ring this onto there and this one. Onto here. So that's our gauge. We need to clamp that together with something. Maybe this will work here. Just 
is so are now bore gauge doesn't uh, pop it open or something. So that's the gauge. We're going to set our dial bore gauge two. Now let me see. I put all these in. I have one close to that size. Uh, actually, I do already have something set up here. So let me let's see if I can. Uh, Show how I do this and close this. I don't need this after all. And I, uh, what I like to do is, is adjust my indicator to where I'm on the first hundred thousandths of its travel. So somewhere. I could keep this in there. Somewhere like this, to where the, the, the small needle is on the one, the first division, and I'm on zero. That way it gives me enough travel in the compressed direction. I like that, so I'm going to tighten this clamp and then I'm going to zero this dial out. I'm rocking it both directions. That's twisting it back and forth, and, this, and I want to get the null reading. on both directions until I get my zero set. So that's that's my dial bore gauge set. That simple. I already had all this already set up for something that must have been very close to that diameter. Now we can uh, go over to the part and we can bore it, but we got to get it closer than I think we got it to well, I don't know, maybe the gauge will go down that far. Yeah, it might. That's why I set it on the low side of the, of the reading, not like in the middle of the travel of the dial indicator, so that I can compress the, the gauge and work up to my dimension from a smaller size. If you set it in the middle, you have less travel. Of course, you only got like a 20 thousandths minus you can go, but you set it on one side like I do. This, this travel, this indicator has a, what is the travel of this thing anyway? It's like a, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousandths. So, you know, if you set it in the middle of its travel, you only got 20 thousandths, 25 thousandths that you can go. But if you set it on one end, you got more travel in the minus direction. So your hole can be smaller to start with. All right, let's see what we're doing. Here. Let's see what the finish looks like in here. Not too bad. I don't know if you can see that or not. Let me, uh, might be a little too much light. I'll take the light away so you can see the. Almost exactly, well, almost just a little less than 20 thousandths undersized right now. I had to go that much more. This is looking through the window of the machine. I turned the coolant on. Let's see what it looks like here. Look, through the spindle flood coolant is, is all I put on, not the high pressure. That did, with the coolant on, that did improve the finish in the hole. So, let me see here. It's not really, I can't really turn enough RPM on this uh, machine spindle. Okay, I've got four and a half thousandths to go. 
All right, I lost power in the middle of doing this one, but fortunately I already had it out to size. Didn't really want to rerun it after repairing the machine up because it was so close to the size. I ended up having to take it, I don't know if you can see that. It's, um, it's about a tenth, well, not quite a tenth, um, bigger than 25 millimeters in order to get it to fit in there the way I wanted to where I could pull it in and out. When it, when it was right on 25 millimeters, it was very difficult to get it to start in the hole to begin with. And I think that um, even, it, even still is hard to get it to start. I also think that the, uh, there might be a hair of a taper to this OD. See, now this one goes in nicely and it's, it's snug when it bottoms out in there. So that's about the way I wanted it to fit. See, it won't, it won't come out of there, but the pressure would blow it out of there easily because at um a thousand around a thousand psi let's say i developed that kind of pressure behind this thing with the coolant blowing through that would be oh about 700 and something pounds of force blowing it out of there see it's it's in there just about the way i wanted it i wanted to be able to um the, the nut here is looser I wanted to be able to uh, pull it out of there if I needed to for some reason without having to, you know, like use a slide hammer or something on this end of this thing. So that's perfect. That's just the way I wanted it. In fact, they're a little bit easier to get in and out without the nut on there. The nut gives you just, as, just a little bit of play to your feel. This one feels... That one's a little bit snugger. That one must be a tenth or so bigger in diameter than the other one, especially when it gets back in there. This one, this one here slides in there a little bit easier. But now I'm going to do that to the other two. I'm a little bit reluctant to try to start in this one. The power just went out. But, um, and then I got to put it back in the, in the, turning spindle in the in the capto adapter and I'm gonna put each one of these in in there and clamp it like with a machinist clamp or something and mill the spot face into the side of this thing and it, it'll also kind of key it but I don't think we'd have to worry about this thing spinning from torque too much it's the it's just holding it in there from the coolant pressure because see there's kind of a cavity I don't know if you can see it back in there I've got a shoulder in there and the coolant comes in behind the cavity of that and it goes down these flats is the way this thing's designed you can see the the holes and these holes go off kind of at an angle in here to hit that impeller and spin it and then the coolant comes out around that and through these little holes all these holes in the end of this and it kind of they're kind of angled down to blow on the tool um, this O-ring in here feels like a pretty hard, hard O-ring, maybe a 90 durometer or something like that. That kind of preloads the bearing races. So when you screw this in and, and uh, bottom it out, it, um, it preloads everything. I don't, I don't really think they're using angular contact bearings. I think these things are just, uh, um, deep groove bearings here so that that o-ring preloads it they don't really say in the instructions to uh, to put these on in any specific direction so i think they're just normal maybe deep groove bearings they have a, they have kind of a shield on them but I think the coolant actually, I don't know if these things have grease in them or the coolant actually lubricates them or not. So that, this is the little impeller thing. This is some kind of a, 
I don't know, plastic or composite or something. I think you told me it was a composite material. And the bore is actually quite a bit smaller than the three millimeters. So it's gonna, when you press it all together, that three millimeter shank expands this out a little bit, I'd imagine, because it, it, it must fit a little bit loose in here before it goes on there maybe, I don't know. We'll see how that works. We're gonna mill the little notch in the side of this to line up with this. The way I, best way I determined to do this is to uh, just stick the spindle in there and clamp it with this machinist clamp here. Tighten it up. And then we got a, a program that uh, to run. We're just gonna mill a helix down in there. Be putting one of these type of screws in here. I've stopped a little bit short of, of the bottom of the counterbore, so the screw head actually should make up on the um, the spindle itself instead of the bottom of the of the counterbore, and kind of shove it down in there. There's like you saw earlier. There's a, a little bit of a step in the in the bore here that the end of the spindle hits on, so it provides a gap for the coolant to get behind it and go down all the four flats because that's where the um that's where the holes in the side of the spindle cartridge are drilled to to um push on the impeller to rotate it. So that's all there is to this. Take this thing out of here. Just take this uh, clamp off of here. That should come right out of there. See, so that's the little notch in the side of it. All right, this is the way this thing works. You put these, uh, here's the two bearings and the, and the little impeller. So you're gonna stick this first bearing in here and then stick this, the tool's gonna to go through it this way. So you stick the chamfer, you want the chamfer in at the end of the tool like this. Stick that in there like that. And this, other bearing. Then you start your, your tool in here like this. And you stick this whole thing on the assembly see here. I'm just going to do it in this oh, this um, milling vise I had on the table here. So you just press it in there in the bearings. Until you come up against that that guide thing and then you take the guide off and then you can press this till it's flush with the end of the
the end of the fixture. So now the whole thing comes out of there, it's all put together like that. Then this is gonna go in the, in the spindle like so. I gotta go get the, I didn't bring the end caps over here. Then you take this end cap and put on here and see it has a like an o-ring inside there that's kind of a hard rubber type of stuff and it, it hits on the, the bearing race and preloads the whole thing so you just stick that on there and tighten it up it, it comes against the shoulder of the the spindle uh, housing so really it, you probably don't have to tighten it too tight and that's it like that. I don't know if it'd pay to shorten this tool. I, 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 I'm gonna try them with it just like this to begin with. So the other tool, it's a little uh, 3 30 seconds drill. Do the same thing. And what they, what they say is that you change the, um, you change the bearings and the and everything in the impeller when you change the tool. So in a way that's kind of nice because you don't have to really worry too much about the bearings wearing out or, or not being, you know, or being dirty or something because you're just going to change them with every tool anyway. So open the vise up. That, that this, I think it's a piece of aluminum or something just kind of guides the tool. And you have, see this says three on here, if you can see that. Um, so this is the set for the three millimeter. I think this is aluminum, it feels like aluminum. They do have a slot in here so you can kind of see your tool if you need to. That's the other drill. I already mounted the end mill in the, in the other one. And those are the, uh, those are the three tools that I'm going to need. Just tighten it like that. So those are the, the two drills. And here's the end mill mount in here. Now I got a stub length end mill so it, it doesn't stick out as far as the drills. I don't, I don't think that's gonna have a problem with the length of that, of the drill sticking out like that. If I did, I guess I could grind the ends of the shanks off and shorten them up. I already ran this one in the machine, and it's um, it's kind of strange. You can't really hear it running, and you can't see it because the coolant is blowing out all these little holes over the top of the tool, so you really can't see it even. Though um, even with um. Let me blow some air through here. You can spin it up with air. I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not. I don't know how fast it turns with the air. So, now all I can just do is make a test program. see how this works. If I take very light cuts, I don't see why it'd be a problem. I mean, I, I blew air through here and I, and I just put a piece of wood up against this end mill and it has a little bit of power even with air. So, the shop air has probably got a, I don't know, 130 PSI here. So, 
you know, with with a thousand psi of coolant, it should have enough power. I hope. We're gonna see. All right, I machined a test piece for these tools. We're gonna come in to test these angle head things, and the the part that's gonna be machined has these bosses on here, like this. And so, in order to test this, because they they get spot faced on both sides, you can see that, and the little hole on both of these. So in order to test this whole idea out and these tools, because I've never used a tool like this before, I made this little kind of test piece. I had this piece of aluminum laying around and so I just, you know, cut a notch out here so the angle head will fit in here and then uh, put a hole that sort of simulates the, the actual part, the way it's going to be before these come down. So I've run this program up to this point. Now I'm going to see what happens with these little angle heads when I change to them. All right, that actually went pretty good. The um, the finish looks kind of strange, but it's very smooth. It's like a, a almost a mirror. You can see the reflection on it, and the holes drilled fine, intolerance and everything. And the 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 counterbore is a little bit small, but I can adjust that in the cam software because I can't really use cutter comp on this because I've defined the the tools as lathe tools, turning tools, if you will, because that, that way I can clamp the spindle in the different orientations. But, but the problem is, is that there's nothing in the tool definition to uh, describe a diameter or radius of a, there, there's a tip radius, but I tried that and used cutter comp and it, it didn't even pick it up. So I'll just go with a center line tool path and I'll just have to adjust it either with a um, stock allowance or change the diameter of the end mill slightly or something. They came out about four thousandths under the, the nominal, which is still intolerance actually, but it's um, they're a little bit small and I can adjust it. So that's going to be it for this uh, little series of videos on making the angle heads. Now I got to get to the real parts now that I've verified everything works. So thanks for watching. <laughs>